Good morning, gentlemen. How are you this fine day? Yes, I think this is day three or four of the crisis. Here we go, international affairs into the quagmire, America's involvement into Vietnam. Men, we had troops in Vietnam as early as 1953. They were advisors under President Eisenhower. President Kennedy didn't want to get involved in this war. He thought it was a war of national liberation. No, he thought it was Vietnam's version of, of American independence. Lyndon Johnson believed in the domino theory and would not let another country fall to communism. China had fallen, Korea had fallen, and he was going to make a stand in Vietnam. A line is drawn. Gentlemen, we're up against a very interesting enemy, the Viet Cong. We talked about this before, how these people who had mastered the Sun Tzu and the art of guerrilla warfare are going to baffle us. They have no real air force. They have nothing in comparison to the industrial might that we have. But yet this country the size of California is going to give us all that we can handle. Home field advantage, spirited fighters, and people who truly believe in the cause. They want it to be free. They used everything to their abilities. Women, men, children, punji sticks unexploded uh, uh, weaponry from the United States when bombs did not fall off the wing of an aircraft and they were discarded, the enemy would find them. Or if they were dropped an aircraft and they found them, they would make hundreds and thousands of homemade grenades from one single American bomb. These are punji sticks on the right. We talked about the fact that those bamboo sticks can cause a lot of problems for an American GI when it goes into your ankle. This is the flag of the Viet Cong. These are the local guerrillas in South Vietnam who are our allies. They are terrorists. They look like farmers and businessmen in the daytime. And at night, they do their job, blowing up installations, destroying aircraft, assassinating our allies, high commanders, mayors, you name it. They are the enemy that we cannot see in South Vietnam below the 17th parallel. This is the flag of North Vietnam. That's the flag that flies over all of Vietnam because in 1975, Vietnam was reunited. And Saigon, the southern capital, became known as Ho Chi Minh City. This is the flag you will see today. It is flying and has been flying since 1975. America's first and only military loss. This is the country of South Vietnam. This is the country we helped create. It was a country we hoped to make into a miniature Asian United States, if you will. That flag no longer exists. Our efforts to build democracy in South Vietnam are not going to be successful. Remember, men, a lot of the people in South Vietnam were Catholics, and the government was Catholic, and they had no patience for the Buddhist or any other point of view. So there's going to be a racial conflict between people that are Vietnamese and not Vietnamese. There's going to be a religious conflict between the Buddhists and the Catholics, and there's going to be an ideological conflict, the idea of democracy and capitalism versus socialism and communism. We're going to try, and we're not going to be successful in introducing permanent democracy into South Vietnam. I mean, it all started back in 1964 in the Gulf of Tonkin. The Gulf of Tonkin is off the coast of North Vietnam, when supposedly, the USS Maddox and the USS Turner Joy were attacked by Vietnamese, North Vietnamese torpedo boats. To this day, we argue whether or not that attack actually happened. But one thing is for sure, the CIA had been operating in these waters for a very long time. And so that's why the enemy was very suspicious any time they saw boats in their waters. The enemy claimed that we were inside North Vietnam's territorial waters, and the United States says we weren't. Anyway, to the next couple of days on August 5th and 6th, supposed attacks against the American fleet was enough to make Congress give President Johnson the authority to act in Vietnam. Now, men, this blank check that's going to be given to President Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, does not have a time limit. It simply gave him the powers to protect American interests in Southeast Asia. It was, in essence, a blank check. Today, we don't do that anymore because of the War Powers Act, which limits the president's ability to act without permission of Congress. Remember, only Congress 
can declare war. But this was kind of an executive action. See that down there? That's the Gulf of Tonkin Yacht Club. That's kind of an insignia that the guys that were involved in the early days of the war in the 1960s, sailing off the waters of North Vietnam. That's their little, that's their little logo. In the right-hand corner is President Lyndon Johnson, the president who tried to practice containment and truly believed in the domino effect. There's the Turner Joy and the USS Ward. It's interesting to note that the only damage ever found on the USS Maddox was a single 50 caliber dent from a bullet. That's kind of thin evidence to start a war, but that debate will go on for a long, long time. Men, these are some of the most dramatic photographs of the Vietnam conflict. In, 19, pardon me, in 1968, the enemy came out of their holes and they attacked over 162 major cities and villages. We never saw them fight like this because they like to hit and run. The photograph you see in the top is that when we left Vietnam in 1975, we left 45,000 Amerasians, Vietnamese children born of American fathers. It was a very, very big tragedy. On the right, in downtown Saigon, we see South Vietnamese security forces literally executing suspected Viet Congs in the street without a trial. When these photographs hit the New York Times, it caused quite a political stir, especially with the young people. And this tragic photograph that you see on the bottom, this tragic photograph you see on the bottom is when we accidentally hit a friendly village with napalm, jellied gasoline. I'm happy to say that poor girl in the center now lives in the United States, survived third degree burns, and was able to become a doctor and she studied in California, I believe. So there is a happy, happy ending to at least that story. This is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Remember we talked about this. An invisible highway, like arteries in your body, like capillaries, with thousands upon thousands of little roads. And those little roads carried on the back of bicycles supplies for the enemy in the South. Men, this was like a virus. Well, maybe like a cancer because when you wipe out one cell, there's a thousand cells to replace it. How do, you how do you beat an enemy that's determined to take bicycles and will voluntarily walk for three months down the trail to make sure that the guerrillas in South Vietnam, America's ally, are never without supplies? Remember what Napoleon said, an army runs on its stomach, and this army is running on its stomach. They are never ever without bullets, rice, or medical supplies. The American bombing, and we tried very hard to wipe out this, it's not going to happen successfully. There is the B-52 bomber. Men, try to imagine 35,000 feet, you don't even see these bombers, you don't hear them, and the next thing you know, they're dropping four times the ordinance of a regular bomber World War II. If you're even a half a mile away from this thing, the shock will knock you down knock the wind out of your chest, right? It, in fact, the enemy was so scared of the B-52s that often they would urinate themselves when the, the strikes began. But somehow, we could not break the morale of the people. You see that tank on the upper left? That's an old French tank. That's one of their trophies from the first Indochina War. I guess Vietnam and the Americans, I guess you could call that the second Indochina War. And on the right, when the Ho Chi Minh Trail was bombed or interdicted, the enemy simply went along the rivers. We could learn a lot by studying this, these simple farmer warriors. Men, the United States Navy is going to have aircraft carriers off North Vietnam, 17th parallel. That's called Yankee Station. If your Phantoms or Skyhawks were past the 17th parallel in the south, that was called Dixie Station. Many of my family members, my, 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 fa my uh, father, pardon me, my mother's brother did three tours on USS Bonhomie Richard and he was a flight boss and he said that these planes, when they went over North Vietnam, faced some of the worst artillery and anti-aircraft fire that Americans have ever seen. In fact, Hanoi is going to be one of the most heavily defended cities in all of Vietnam, in fact, in all of history. And this is where your home was. This is our foreign policy. 
This is, the, I believe, the Seventh Fleet. I'll have to check that out. All right, this is the USS Enterprise. No, I think it's the Oriskany. And this is going to be your permanent home. You land, you eat, you live, you fight, you fly, you come back. This is, the, our, the, this is our foreign policy from the air and from the sea. But somehow, we just couldn't break the will of these people. Special Forces. It was John F. Kennedy who first suggested the idea of Special Forces. Individual, highly trained units that can go deep behind enemy lines, operate independently, and basically live on their own. They're the best trained soldiers we have. Counter guerrilla warfare, enemy weaponry, psychological warfare. Their job was to understand the enemy and actually to build strategic hamlets and places to keep our friends safe from the enemy. They often went on long range reconnaissance patrols to tell the bombers that the bombs are hitting. They often went deep behind enemy lines for weeks at a time to try to gather intelligence or to liquidate high ranking enemy officials. And they were considered to be the best of the best, the Green Berets. It's interesting to note that 97% of the people that apply for the Green Berets fail to graduate. They're still with us today. And many of them are feel a little bit bitter about Vietnam because they felt that we left a lot of Vietnamese behind, like the Montagnards, the mountain people, who are our friends. And they were with us because they hated the communists. But when everything fell apart in Saigon in 1975, we had to leave a lot of our friends behind, including the mountain Montagnards, the people of the mountains. And once the enemy, the communists, captured them, they were not spared. Their families, everybody. If you were an America's ally, it got you prison and it got you a death sentence. Green Berets, their motto is, uh, I can do this, simper oppressive. Always get rid of the tyrants. Here they are in one of their fire bases near the 17th parallel in a place called Da Nang. Most of them are young, heavily trained, heavily motivated, truly believing in the American mission to establish democracy in South Vietnam. The lads, I want to tell you something, okay? It's a very political war. And in our next episode, all right, we're going to go talk about John F. Kennedy. And we're going to talk about some other incidents in the Cold War, such as the U-2 affair. And we'll go back to Eisenhower a little bit. But I just want you to know that, that these type of people, this generation, when they came back from Vietnam, they were not considered heroes. In fact, the young people who did not serve, did not serve in the military, who became draft dodgers, looked at these guys as baby killers. When they came home, many of their generation who did not fight in the war spit upon them, carried signs, and really there were no big parades. There were no real World War II type style parades. And it's unfortunate, man, because they never really got the credit they deserved until almost the 1990s. If you ever have a chance to visit the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., it is absolutely, it'll, it'll take your breath away. It has the name of, I believe, of 58,000 dead Americans on that wall. And I'm sorry to say that three of my friends from my teenage years who are older than I am are on that wall. And, you know, as they say, in the military, everybody gave some, but some gave all. And in this particular case, there were a lot of good Americans believing in freedom and democracy who did not get a chance to come home because they believed in an idea. And that idea was that communism must be stopped. Looking forward to seeing you guys again, and I hope you have a great day. And remember, OB's thinking about you. Peace, and we're saying goodbye. <laughs> Thought I was going somewhere with this. Hope I didn't just erase it. We're still playing now. Oh, yeah, it is.